Let's talk about STP, and I don't mean the grunge band from the 90s, I'm talking about Spanning Tree Protocol. If you're running a network with more than one switch, and let's face it, you probably are, STP is the protocol that makes sure your data packets don't get caught up in an endless loop also known as a broadcast storm, which is absolutely one of the quickest ways to bring your network to its knees. This is where STP comes in. It prevents network loops by designating a path for your traffic and by blocking redundant paths. It's super simple to set up, but also very useful to understand, especially if you want to configure it correctly for network efficiency. To explain how this works and when you may want to use variants of STP like RSTP or MSTP, I'm going to toss it over to Crosstalk's resident network expert, David Barger. He's going to walk you through the nuts, bolts, and the bridges of Spanning Tree Protocol. And remember, Crosstalk is available for hire if you'd like us to dig into your network to make sure that everything is flowing smoothly and set up with best practices. You can book a consultation with Dave or any of the Crosstalk crew by heading over to crosstalksolutions.com and clicking on contact. Okay, so now let's dig into the fun and exciting world of Spanning Tree Protocol. Take it away, Dave. There are three primary forms of STP, STP, RSTP, and MSTP. Let's first start off with the basic STP or spanning tree protocol. So what is it? STP is used to prevent network loops. That's all. If you've been part of the IT community for any time, you know what happens whenever there's a loop in a network. Say somebody walks into a networking closet and takes a switch and plugs it back in on itself. This can cause complete chaos. It creates what's called a broadcast storm and it can bring the network to a crashing halt. As a tip, you can easily diagnose this while on site. If you walk into the networking closet and you see all of the link lights blinking in perfect unison, you likely have a broadcast storm. Normally, link lights should blink fairly independently of each other. In 1980, a lady by the name of Radia Joy Perlman invented STP, which subsequently she wrote a fantastic poem about it. Without using the poem, this is how it works. Let's take, for example, you have a group of three network switches. We'll plug them into each other in a ring type fashion. One of them has a connection to the router, which is generally connected to the internet. By default, we know this won't work. The switches will start to indefinitely relay their packets to each other, causing this broadcast storm. STP has a unique way to fix this. It causes a break in this loop, a virtual break. This break is called an STP block. But how does it decide where to place this break in the loop? I mean, there is definitely a most efficient place to put this, but how does it determine that? Well, the switch closest to the router is generally where we want all of the traffic to route, at least the majority of the traffic. We would consider this the root switch or the root bridge. Ideally, we break the loop opposite of this as far away as possible. That way, whenever the traffic is routed from the remote switches, they don't have to go through so many hops. So how do they determine who the root bridge is? This is the first phase of STP. A negotiation happens to determine who this root bridge is. It determines this based on a set priority. You've likely seen this setting inside your switch for STP. It seems like it's this arbitrary number that increments in multiples of 4096. For practical purposes, what you need to know is that the switch with the lowest priority priority will be selected by the group to be the root bridge. If you don't set this, most of your switches will have the same priority, so then it will go based on MAC addresses. So if you don't switch it, it's going to be fairly random. So make sure you go in there and set your root switch that have the lowest priority. Once the group decides who the root bridge is, they need to determine the cost to reach that switch. This is how they determine the most efficient way to get to this switch and where to place the block. More or less, every hop it takes to get to this root bridge, they're going to increase a value. Now this value is going to be incremented by ranges shown on the screen here, which are based on port speeds. Now some switches do allow you to manually change this, but most of them will be this amount. In most modern simple STP setups, you don't have to worry about this, especially for small businesses. You just need to ensure that your switches have the correct priority set. They'll figure out the rest. Now once that's all done, the switch has determined who the root bridge is and the most efficient path to get back to it, it's going to automatically now know where to place this block. Let's run through a quick real world example. To keep this simple, we're back to three switches. The priority values are shown on the screen there. Which switch do you think will be considered the root bridge? It should be the one with 4096 because it has the lowest priority. 
Now with that, where do you think the switches are going to place the STP block? We're going to assume that the port costs are all the same. Let's say they're all one gig connection. So that block is going to appear between switch B and A. That right there is the basic principle of STP. You should also know that your switches are keeping track of this constantly. Should a new break be introduced by maybe a bad wire, they're gonna renegotiate this whole thing and remove the block if needed. This makes STP a really simple, primitive way to add a little bit of redundancy to your network. And it's important to note that we're showing you a very simple ring type topology here. Spanning tree can be very useful in other types of topologies like this tree topology we have from the Unify website. And if you're interested in learning more about those, you can take the knowledge from this video and go check out the article we have linked below. Now, what about the other types of STP? They largely work the same, but have some improvements. RSTP stands for rapid spanning tree. It has some improvements that makes the spanning tree convergence slash negotiations happen a little bit quicker. It also adds a couple new port roles, such as designated edge ports, alternate ports, and backup ports, which each do roughly what you think they do. MSTP stands for multiple spanning tree. As opposed to the other ones we just discussed, this one has multiple multiple loops in mind. We've had a lot of clients here at Crosstalk Solutions come to us with a basic plan of introducing a lot of loops into their switch network and hoping that STP will just take care of it. Most of the time, whenever you want to purposely introduce a couple redundant loops, you'd be much better suited by using some other switching protocol or even some dynamic routing protocol such as OSPF. And that's really it for STP. Remember, the goal of STP is to prevent network loops, which can take down an entire network. It always starts by trying to figure out who the root bridge is, by STP priority and then uses port cost to determine the best path back to that root bridge. And you should always set your STP priority whenever you have multiple switches on a network. This will help you ensure STP does what it needs to in the event of a network loop. If you ever have any enterprise network design needs, don't hesitate to reach out to us here at Crosstalk Solutions. As always, thanks for watching and subscribing.